I am delighted to be joined by Simon Neal of Biffy Clyro. Mate, how are you? I'm pretty good, Bees. How are you doing, brother? Good, man. Good. I'm dying to get into this because literally my list of questions is like this. So I'm going to steam straight in. Let's um, do it, man. We were just talking beforehand that I didn't get the chance to talk to you on Ellipsis. Now, what I wanted to ask you is now we're in 2020 and you've got the hindsight of each of the records in your back catalogue. Yeah. What do you make of Ellipsis? Because it felt like pretty soon afterwards you were talking about changes of directions. So I just wondered what your take was. Yeah, I, I think, to be honest, Ellipsis, it's the first album where I really only thought about the songs and the songwriting. I kind of removed the band dynamic from what we were doing. You know, normally as soon as I've got a song written, I take it into Ben and James and we build it up and we kind of pull it back into like a three-piece rock and roll band dynamic. In Ellipsis, I, it was a deliberate move, but I kept a lot of the songs, kind of just recordings, and, and we were trying to kind of feel them out in the studio, which I think was a really worthwhile project, and I do really love the record, but when I listen back, it just lacks that little spark that, that our band has always had, which is kind of the more chaotic and kind of abrasive side and I think when I'm sitting writing myself and, and just letting the melodies come, it maybe loses that next step up of the live energy that we bring. So, so certainly listening back, there's a couple more kind of abrasive moments that would maybe have inserted into the record. But, um, but again, that's what keeps you coming back and making the next one. You know, if you, if you felt that you need something entirely perfect, it's like, what's the point in doing another one? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Always so imperfect enough, imperfect enough. That's the key. <laughs> Mate, I've been using that line for years. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, when, you, when you take songs in to Ben and James and you start doing your thing when you start picking the material apart and getting into it, is that where that intricate weirdness that Biffy Clyro specialise in uh, comes from? Is, is well, that where that dynamic really comes to the fore? Yeah, because because I write, like I write all the music, so I kind of write the bass and the drums as well. And when I'm thinking of us as a three piece, which to be honest is how I've always written, you know, normally I'm writing and Ellipsis was the first time where I was trying to kind of escape that writing for a three piece. But that's where I love just the way we trade off our, our rhythms. You know, whatever James is playing needs to kind of be reactive and, and instinctive off the back of what I'm doing. And then same with the drums. So we try, I try and kind of build the songs up as three separate parts so that when it comes together and those moments where everything connects, it's like a real power, you know, like a punch to the face. And um, so, yeah, it, it, and then sometimes the way Ben will interpret something I'm asking them to play, you know, as soon as Ben puts his personality into the kind of ideas I have, it just it makes me hear things differently. And I think that's that's the chemistry of being in a band. You know, I think most bands have someone that comes in with the ideas and where the song should go. And then it's just in that kind of almost miscommunication that you discover something brand new. And it's it's so special. I, I never get tired of it. You know, it's you're never sure what's round the corner. Was this the first time? Did you ever consider, as a songwriter, throwing the baby out with the bathwater for the first time? Because <laughs> when, I, when I heard that, because the thing is, because there's very distinct eras of mm -hmm. Biffy's career, it felt like, OK, so this next one, we don't really know what to expect. Was it, were you ever tempted to go real left field? Y yes, I mean, I'm always... You know, one of my favourite bands the last couple of years is a band called Imperial Triumphant and Mate, the, that record fucking kills oh, that Alphaville Alpha album. I've not stopped yeah. playing it. It's beautiful. Well I, I'm I'm still obsessed with their previous one, Vile Love. Right. And, and I'm actually in my time off I'm working on two kind of more avant garde projects. One's called Empire State Bastard. And that's gonna be like it's like a grind core kind of crusty, kind of like really doomy, almost black metal at points. But really nice. ugly, really abrasive. And that's kind of inspired by like enjoying like I Hate God and Imperial Triumphant and that more really much more kind of toothsome sound, I guess. And yeah. kind of that real swampy kind of sound. And then I'm doing another project, which is more of a drone project, which will be more like oh, shit. and sun. And that's with a couple of my other friends. And we... Um, one of them's like an electronic musician and he just works in these weird, like he works with deteriorated tape and stuff. So he, he'll just play a tape for four days and then record onto it. So it's got this hiss and this crackle. 
So there's times where with Biffy, I've, I've thought about going full left field and making something really abstract. And then, you know, I still have a love of pop music, Bees. And, and I think, I feel yeah, like, I feel lucky that Biffy has the, the audience it does. And I always want to push our audience, which is why, like, on this album, we've got, like, a song, like, Instant History, and then a song, like, Cop Syrup, which is, like, six minutes long, a bit more prog, it's got screaming on it. So I do like to push people to the edge, but the reality is Biffy's the home for my songs, and I don't think, I think as still as, as long as I'm still writing, you know, song-based music, that'll go into Biffy, and we might do weird stuff in the meantime, but... There's a structure to Biffy that I enjoy. I like the limitation of the three instruments, the three vocals, and then when we make the record, I kind of build on it there. But I like that limitation. You know, I always remember Jack White saying that with the white stripes that he actually, the fact that there's only two of you means that you utilize all the ideas you have. And I, and I still don't feel like I've, I'm out of juice for a three piece rock yeah. band yet. Yeah, man. Well, the thing is, like, your band fascinate me, right? The public perception. Of Biffy Clyro, I find fascinating. Because <laughs> you're, well, your your music is gloriously weird, right? If you really listen, if you listen to the canvas that you guys lay out, there's loads of weird intricacies and interesting musical shit. And mm -hmm. yet, there are people who like like harder music who treat Biffy Clyro with suspicion. Yeah. Like, like when you were when. Like, what is your take on that? As someone, because I'll compare you to Devin Townsend in a minute, because I had a conversation with him a little while ago that was eerily similar to what you were just saying. So what's your take on how you are taken by hard rock circles? It, it's strange, because I grew up, you know, I mean, I grew up, I mean, we're obviously on Not Faced and Mosh Talks here. And when my, you know, I went to, I saw Slipknot in the 90s and their first tour of the UK at the Barrowlands yeah. in Glasgow. I saw... Pantera and Reinventing the Steel, you know, I've seen so many incredible records and it's all those heavy gigs. Metallica was my first proper show. That's my education. That's where all my inspiration comes from is, is heavy, heavy music. I appreciate that most people know us, if they don't know our band inside out, they know for our singles and our singles are big and pop-tastic. And I won't, I won't apologize for that because I still love like rock set and shit. Like, like, Fuck Real yes. Fucking 80s tunes. Yeah. So, so that's always in what we do. But I do have a mild frustration when people think that we're one thing when we're not. But I also take solace in the fact that those who know, know. And yeah, I, and I, really. And, and, and it gives me a sense of uh, kind of joy and, and, and inner confidence that, that people, that the people in the know, they do know that we do everything. You know, that we do as weird music as anyone hears and also as, as sweet and pretty. But... Um, it's kind of hard to say because I guess if I could control it, I would. I would want everyone to think we're we're basically the mixture of Tina Turner and and Slipknot. You know, like I would want everyone <laughs> yeah, that yeah. loves all those bands to like us. But the reality is, people that maybe love Tina don't maybe love Meshuggah. People that love Meshuggah maybe don't like fucking Brian Adams '80s stuff. So I appreciate yeah. that my tastes aren't always for everyone, but. You know what, it's what I love. I love extremes in music. You know, I really love really pretty things. I love really dark things and nothing in the middle. And, and I think that's where our band inhabits, which is probably why there can be a slight confusion, you know, about about how heavy we are or, or what, our, what our inspirations are. But, I, but as you know, it's like, there's none more odds. We're called Biffy Clyro. It's the worst fucking name ever. We're trying to put people off from the very start. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, do you know what? I'll tell you what, I... I take offence because you're not here, look, with the well. No, I was going to say with the best of respect. You're not hearing the Kings of Leon drop fucking blast beats in their songs. Do you know what no, I mean? Do you exactly. know what I mean? It, that's that's that does get to me if we get lumped in with with, with certain bands that I maybe I'm excited by because yeah. you know what we do. We bring in bits of black black metal. We bring in blast beats. We bring in like a bit of doom riffs. We down tune our guitars to yeah. eight points. You know, yeah. but we're not scared of kind of anything and. Yeah. But yeah, we, we aren't one dimensional, that's the thing. I think people that maybe just know us as a surface level think they could figure us out from our singles, but I think people in the know know that it's a much more complex story than that. Where does Download Festival fit into this, man? Because oh. the thing is, like, I I saw you play... In fact, I reviewed you for Kerrang! on Puzzle when you were on the second stage. Uh, and it was fucking... Like, no one then, no one then was going... 
why a biffy clyro here right it's not like it's like again I'll, I'll tell it like it is it's not it's not like muse who suddenly decided they were a rock band and turned up at donington for a, <laughs> for a year and fucked off again right <laughs> biffy clyro have lived there like what's oh. your take on that whole thing yeah, well, again, it's tough. It's just that perspe- perception of the band, you know. But but just for anyone that doesn't know, I mean, we first played Download in 2004, maybe even 2003. Right. We, we played it probably six or seven times over the years. You know, it, it's a festival that's that supported us in every step we've made as a band. It's, it's a festival where all my favourite bands I've played over the years and I've been lucky enough to see them as I've been, you know, sharing the bill with them over a weekend. It's it's an honour. See when see when I see our name up there, and make no mistake, any download fans that, that don't want us there, I, I I know what it is to be in that top line. I know what the what Donington Monsters of Rock was. You know, I'm not too fucking young to <laughs> to forget that. You know, it's things like, I remember the Donington Festival in the 90s when it had like Sepultura, Pantera, Therapy, you know, some of, the, some of those years, like Crowbar, like some of those years were just so educational to me. And as, you know, I was a crying reader as well growing up these yeah. days. But I know what, I know what, what Download is. I know what it means. We take it very seriously. I, can, I understand if you're wanting Iron Maiden, we're maybe not. You know, not, we're, yeah. we're not quite as metal. There definitely yeah. are are more metal, rather than none more metal. There's yeah. a, few, a few more metal. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know what? We fucking love it. And and you know what? The people that are doubting us, come and watch us. We'll fucking blow your tits off. Absolutely, mate. I've been going to the Reading Festival since 1997, and the first time you headlined is the best set I have ever seen at that festival oh, ever so ever much. ever mate i burst into tears three times in that set and oh, that God. never happens to me ever machines was fucking ah anyway right thank you so much we currently have to talk about delivering your album in the weirdest part of human history right <laughs> and you've you've you took the streaming the live streaming idea into a terrain that i was desperate to see people take it into, like Behemoth did a week or two ago. Yes, what like, a show. Right? Play so, the church, yeah, fucking amazing. So when you're putting together the, the new record, how you're going to deliver it, and the ability to visually display that art to people in whichever ways your budgets allow, <laughs> like, like, what was that like and what was your attitude towards it? Because it suggests that you had a better attitude than just, well, guess we've got to do something. Yes, actually, I, I kind of savoured the challenge, to be honest, Bees, when as every musician, and I'm sure yourself as well, you know, you're able to keep doing this, but the, the live thing is, it just obviously was heartbreaking for every band in the world that we had to stop playing. As soon as we stopped, my mind started going, like, I'm a kind of worst case scenario type of person, so I, I wasn't anticipating things unfolding well you know I was kind of I knew yeah. this year would be a write-off so immediately I started thinking of the visual stimulations of the album and how I could kind of transfer those songs to, to the like live arena and retain the, the intimacy and intensity of a live show without a crowd which is so fucking hard also I think even if I watch like a DVD or, or a concert movie of my favorite band playing to 100,000 people see after four or five songs you kind of feel that you've got the lay of the land. You maybe start skipping to your favourite tunes and you maybe don't watch the full two-hour show. I, I wanted this to be a surprise after surprise. And I really loved the fact that the liberation came from not facing one particular way. I know that sounds so simple, but see yeah. when you're performing as a band, you're normally facing out, you're all facing the same way and there's one kind of source doing this with, and we, we chose to have like four different band setups and we all kind of surrounded the room and at different points we're in different areas. And, and that was what really got my juices flowing was thinking, so we don't need to face this the same way. And then I thought, well, that means we can move. That means we can, like, we don't need the stage. The stage becomes less important. The stage is the most important part of any venue normally. Now it's like, right, well, that's just a tool. So, so then it was just a case of letting the freak flag fly thinking of as many crazy ideas and as you say the boring shit like like budget you know worrying 
you know, yeah. if, if we could physically pull it off. But but I appreciate. Thanks so much for watching, bees. It's it's something I'm really proud of it, and I'm, we're going to do something with it at some point because it, it's almost as important a representation of the album and of this year. I think as as we could have done. You know, it's a document. It's a document that in five years we'll look back. I hope and say. Can you believe that that was the only way that we could communicate our music and share our music? See, the thing is, I've, I've got a take on this that I keep asking everyone about. Mm -hmm. And my take on this is I loved live albums growing up, man. Like, I loved them. Like, Pantera 101 Proof was glued oh. in my CD Walkman, man, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, But the live album's been dead forever because people can literally get home from the show that they've watched and someone's uploaded songs on YouTube <laughs> from the show they've just been to. So what is the fucking point of a live album? But what this does, what this avenue does and what you did and what Behemoth did in particular is to treat these almost like HBO specials that could replace the live album. Like, yeah, do, you, yeah. do, you think there's, do you think there's anything in this beyond, okay, this is what we're doing while we're not touring? Y yes, I do. I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. I think people in bands are now tapping into parts of their brains that, that, that they didn't have to before. And, and necessity kind of brings, what's that? Necessity is the mother of invention. You know, and it feels like people now, especially a few months in, everyone's thinking, oh, well, we now need to make this more of an artistic statement. And, and the visual does become a part of that statement rather than just a documentation or a representation of the music, you know, or a kind of a translation of the music. Hey, we're playing it. This is how it sounds like when we do it live. It should be more than that. And hopefully things like the Behemoth show will make people go, oh, actually, you know what, we're not limited the same way we would be if it was like just a regular live show. The tough thing is, obviously, the, the, the cost of, of like putting on a one-off event means that either you, you need to be maybe a bigger band of the budget or you need to sell it as tickets. And that's the things just to make, you know, you want to make sure that fans are happy to be involved. You don't want to like exploit people. But equally, it's the only chance we have certainly in the next six months to really translate live music and to share it i do think once people tour again that we will retain this level of creativity and the visual yes. aspect because because it's it's all out the box now you know i just i just think yeah. people, people now expect it to a certain extent i don't mean in a bad way but i just mean our lives have changed so much in the last five months and we can't put that shit back in the box so, so instead, let's just embrace it and embrace, embrace the new possibilities we have, yeah. the new technology we have, and and um, I, I've actually found it inspiring. As disappointed and as heartbroken as I am to not tour, I'm now the next few months. I'm thinking, what can we do now? And we're already discussing ways of maybe doing previous albums in a similar way, just, just to kind of until we hit the road and do. You know, we've got eight yeah. albums, eight studio albums, so th there's different ways we could represent records, and I'm looking forward to it. I keep telling anyone who will listen, man. I want Metallica doing Master of Puppets surrounded by the crosses and everything, man. Like, oh, come on, lad. Come Amazing. on, get out there, do I, it. I tell you what, I watched in the SM, SM2 last week, and it's yeah. it lovely to see them. It, I was surprised that they chose a fair few same songs. Yeah, me too. Them. You know, just near the start, I just thought, I thought there's something great, but I really enjoyed watching them, but I'd love to see Metallica, you know. Remember a few years ago they did that tour where they pretended that one of their crew was had died and caught in fire. <laughs> yeah, in the load tour where we set on fire, man. Yeah. yeah. You know, so Metallica are fearless in that way. And they did that movie the other year, that kind of concert movie, which yeah. is weird. So I think Metallica, more than anyone, they have the resources, they have the material, they have the concepts. I think if as long as they're not being too lazy, boys, don't be lazy. <laughs> <laughs> do you think do you think this maybe opens Biffy up globally as well? Because Biffy feels like a British band that travels. Like do that, do you, do that again, it cut off there in a second piece. No worries, man. So uh do you think this will help Biffy out globally as well? Because Biffy are very much seen as like a British band who go to other places, if you get what I mean. Right? Yes. Does this it's does this help? I don't really know. I mean, I guess it's especially for the States. I mean, I guess we do quite well everywhere. And in the States, we, we kind of, there's probably the place that we're not, don't do gotcha. massive shows. It's, 
I mean, I like to think that everything we do, if you do something quality, people talk about it. If you do something that is, is worth and value, people talk about it. You know, I've been doing this too long to expect any anyone to one day just go, wow, who are these guys? They're going to be massive. You know, I, I, I don't gotcha. really care for that anymore, but I want, I want people to connect, connect and care about our music because we fucking do. And I still, even at this stage, not to sound obnoxious or arrogant, I believe we're one of the best bands in the fucking world. And it, it does frustrate me that we're not do, don't do better in America. But shit happens, you know. I feel lucky that we get that we're a pretty successful band in some places, considering how strange we are as well. And and actually, that's what I enjoy more than anything is the fact that we get to survive. And as we discussed earlier, we're quite an unusual band to still be in the mainstream anywhere. So yeah. you know what? I just love playing. When we come to the states, if we're playing to a thousand folk. And they care as much as twenty thousand folk care here. That that matters to me because music. It's not what. It's what how music makes you feel and how how that moment makes you feel. It's not about what's the bottom line. And I think that's what kept us going. Yeah, fucking right, man. That's so, all the best. All the music what? I've cared about. You know, a lot of my favorite bands and records were not popular or not successful, but they changed my fucking life. And then, and I'm never going to not care about those bands. Fuck yes. What, what is it with America then? Is it too weird, too Scottish, or too weird and Scottish? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> I think there's actually, I know there's a couple of things. I mean, we struggle to fit in. Whenever we're in like rock radio, we're like not heavy <sighs> enough. You, and then if, mate, if, we're, if you write if you write a song that would fit on rock radio out here, I'm coming back to Scotland to slap you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's like we don't, we don't quite belong on that. Um, I hear you. Um, and we're too guitar based for everything else. Also, I mean, I've just got excuses coming out my fucking pores here, but I know no, no, no. a Biffy in America is a toilet, it's an outhouse. So we've named oh, it really? after a fucking toilet. <laughs> it's a tough sell from there, it's a isn't tough it? Sell. <laughs> and, then, and then also, like a few years ago, we really we got things kind of moving in the States, and I had a I had a bit of a kind of breakdown in tour, and I just I just hit this wall and, and we had to cancel Coachella. We had to cancel some gotcha. shows with Muse, and it was one of those. When I look back, I'm like, uh, you know, I know that's the moment where we had an opportunity to build the band, and and then my body didn't let me. And I look back and with with regret at that moment. But as I say, I feel I feel happy that people over there do care. If we're not mainstream, a lot of mainstream bands suck ass. So, <laughs> so it does yeah, I hear you. I hear you loud and clear, man. I've got to ask you as well. Because the internet and sometimes rock fans lack a sense of humour. Um, last week on Radio 1, or the week before on Radio <laughs> 1, right? I have never seen a look of mischief on your face <laughs> quite like it as you played a cover of Megan Thee Stallion and... Uh, what's it? It's, it's Megan Thee Stallion and Cardi B, oh, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Wet-Ass Pussy is redone as Wet-Ass Biffy. Yeah. Um, Tell me about the whole wet ass Biffy experience, man. It's, it's funny. I mean, like, we, we thought it was funny. It wasn't funny to some people. Um, I, we've, we've had a long relationship with the Live Lounge and the BBC. Yeah. And you'll know, being a, being a British boy. Um, so the last time we did it, we covered, covered Christine and the Queens, and I did the French rap. Yeah. The time before that, we covered like, Cheryl Cole, who's a British pop star. Before that, we did Single Ladies by Beyonce. So we have form of just covering unlikely songs. Now, I've maybe misjudged what era we're in, but I, I just thought it was fun. We, we wanted to do the biggest pop song of the year, but we weren't allowed to, to do the, uh, the uncensored lyrics because it was fucking lunchtime. So, yeah. so, so I, thought it'd be, I thought it'd be funny to just tweak it to, to, as, a, as a tribute to our live show, if you're wet as Biffy, because anyone that's seen us live knows that we sweat like fuck. So, so it was a bit of fun. It turned out to be not fun at all. <laughs> no, <laughs> bullshit. We upset bullshit. a lot of people. <laughs> no way. Tiny, tiny wee garage, mate. I nearly flipped my, I nearly flipped my desk. I was laughing so hard. Quite fun. The thing is, as well, like, as far as I'm concerned, massive pop songs are fair game. See, see if you've got a, bill, if a billion people are loving your tune. I'm afraid it's not a sacred text. It's a pop song. Songs are allowed to be interpreted and covered, you know, I, I didn't anticipate offence, you know, but shit happens, you know, I, 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 will, I will continue to cover whatever the fucking songs I want to do. <laughs> yes, Fuck song. yeah, man. So, uh, I'll just ask you a few more questions about those side projects before I let you get on with your day, man. Um, so, 
without obviously dropping anyone else in it, in either of these bands, will we have heard of any of your friends that are in these bands? Yeah, but just, just guys that play with Biffy. So the Empire State Bastard, I'm playing with my friend Mike Venart, who used to play oh, a band sick. called Ocean Size. So, yeah. so that's, like, that was inspired entirely by Napalm Death and Discordant Axis and ca Cattle Decapitation. It's ended up Love turning it. in... There's moments that now sound a bit more like Daughters or Swans, which wasn't an intention. Oh, it, was meant, okay. it was meant to be all fast, but we, we, after we worked on the first six songs, it felt that like we needed some weight, some something that would just slow and you know and, and intense and like sinister. So, so it's got a little bit of both. And then the other project is called Tippy Toes, and that's the that's that's the, the and that's the doom one. one. Yeah, it is. So, so that's with the, my friend Gambler, who plays with us live. Who he played in Ocean Size, but he's a, a noise artist himself. He works under the name Richard A. Ingram, and he's released Wicked. eight or nine kind of noise records over the years. And then also another friend called Martin Scott, who played drums in a Scottish band called Aerogram, who were a wonderful oh, band. Oh shit! Right, yeah. The turn of millennium. So it's. To be honest, it, there's not enough days in the year, bees. You know, like, like, yeah. I love the fact that Biffy takes up so much of my time, but it means I've got all these backlog projects that I'm desperate to work on. But next month we're going to be completing the Empire State Bastard in October, then aiming to finish Tippy Toes in November, and then take a view with with how we put it out. I mean, I'd love to put it out. In, I'd love to put Empire State Bastard out in something like Southern Lord or Relapse. That oh, might be that shit, might be pie yeah. in the sky. If anyway. <laughs> That might be pie in the sky, but that's the kind of vibe we want, um, you know, for that project. And and just, you know, I, lo I love things like, see, when I look back at all the I Hate God artwork and everything, you know, it's so yeah, bleak. I love, I love that kind of mixed media, kind of like collage type stuff. And and Mike, the singer, it, 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 he's got such a real twisted view, you know. And I think sometimes the sense of humour and I hate God's lost. A lot of bands are that bleak. Sometimes people miss. I mean, it's, it's it's you got to dig. You got to well, dig. Yeah, you do. Uh, have to. Yeah, to be fair. <laughs> you be willing to dig. I know you're right. Yeah, it's it's not Alien Ant Farm. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, man. I went walking around New Orleans. I got up early when me and my wife were there on holiday and oh, wow. I was up early. So I just went walking around New Orleans listening to Acid Bath and oh. that whole, like, just taking in the ambience of the city. It was one of the best it's, mornings. You know what? I feel one of the few places I haven't been is New Orleans. But you know what? From what oh, I, hear, mate. I hear, the air, the swampy, like, te the temperature, the, the, just the, everything about it, like, almost tells you that you have to make that kind of swampy, deep, slow music, you know? And yeah, it's just something in the water. There's certain parts of the world. In Glasgow, it's like a, a particularly kind of like post rock and kind of quite sincere part of the world because yeah. we spend our lives indoors because of the weather. So we we all we're all students of music, and you know it's amazing how parts of the world do feed in into different genres. You know. So last question. Um, I, was, I was talking to you about Devin Townsend earlier. So mm -hmm. I always remember him saying this, and I. I feel like it's something that can be applied to yourself as well, which is he says when he writes a nice song, right, mm -hmm. there's still a bit in his brain that goes, blah, right? <laughs> that just, that like just feels the intrinsic need to not make it like when you wrote and recorded Pocket, I remember, I remember us having the conversation where I was like, it's so weird to hear you just play four yeah, chords the whole way through it and like, like just in, out, done. Do you, do you feel that that's something that exists in you as a songwriter? Because I, I take, I take offense to people like who think that it's just like they see the Simon Cowell song or whatever. And I'm here to say like the only songwriter that I can think of who I could apply your mindset to is Devin fucking Townsend. <laughs> that's that's a great company. Thank you for saying that. I love Devin's stuff over the years. Yeah, mate. I think it, it's just about not being afraid. I think, you know, we did talk about the Pocket was the very first song that I ever wrote that felt like really like almost so simple it became complex. You know, like like my like my mind couldn't <laughs> deal with it. And, and I think yeah. I think if you come from the, the, the left field world of music and come from weird music, the the mild effort comes on keeping something simple. 
and and I think that's where, that's still where I find my mild challenge is, is with certain songs I'll think no this melody is doing the heavy lifting in this song you know I, I'm actually detracting from what's giving me the feels if I complicate this too much and equally in different songs it can feel like oh this is just you know it feels like it needs that sharp turn now when I'm writing songs I, I like my first like kind of version of a tune I like that. That's always the more left field version of a song because I, I don't. Oh, interesting. I don't, I don't worry about the. For the start, the kind of more left field stuff comes slightly more naturally to me, and and I just don't worry about the flow. I just let it come, and then afterwards, when I live with it and when I'm playing it, there's maybe they'll maybe simplify some sections, but I don't like bringing starting a song that feels too simple, even pocket. When I first wrote that, I wrote it on a guitar that had a CF. G D C F tuning. And like so so it came out as this left field. I was writing weird songs with like just that bottom string, the C and the F just was so heavy down the bottom. And then one day I just wrote pocket. You know, with and it wasn't like the version I did in the album ended up with regular chord shapes, but the way I wrote it, it was all this weird like four finger stuff to make like a regular A chord. So so even a song like that came from the weirdness and then but but the pop when it comes to my singing that's where i really hone in and kind of like melody you know i love screaming my i don't quite have the stamina to scream as much as i do now because i have to sing so much you know so, yeah. so there's certain points where you know i need to kind of figure i mean that sounds so unromantic but whatever you know like no. thinking I'm, I'm gonna go for a high note here rather than just abrasion or chaos or aggression so um but it's always the melody i think if you took my vocal out of a lot of biffy songs People would go, wow, that's fucking weird. But but yeah. I, I, you know, I, I want I want things to seem more simple than they are. I think that's a lot of my favorite band, like Peter Gabriel and stuff, his early stuff. Some of it's really fucking weird, but yeah. it sounds straightforward. And that's how I feel with Biffy songs. If if you're to sit down and try and play a lot of our songs, you wouldn't make it to the end of the first verse because you don't realize we're missing beats, we're playing weird chords, things are moving in weird places. But it feels natural, so so that's always my aim is to kind of like something that's odd and trying to make it feel like it was meant to be that way, you know. Uh, mate, like I cannot wait for the next time we get to chat. When those side projects come out, come back and we'll talk fucking. Oh, I love that. Rains. I tell you, I'm jealous of you in Hollywood, though, you motherfucker. I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, well, I hope the world opens up and we get to see you again. Don't forget, a celebration of endings is out now. Get in the description below where you can check out all things Biffy Clyro. And, uh, yeah, I do hope that that live stream sees see, sees the light of day. Yeah, we're going to do something. We'll, we'll figure out some way. If we DVD at some point or we stream it on, on online in a platform or somewhere, we're figuring out a few things. But thanks so much. Thanks for the support, Brilliant. my brother, as well. Always appreciate it. You got it, man. Uh, they will be blowing a hole in Donington Park at Download 2021. See you next time, Simon. Thanks, Beef. Don't forget to like and share this video and join me on Twitch every Tuesday, Friday and Saturday for guest hangouts, new music votes, tier lists, band-specific competitions, weekly merch roundups and much, much more. That's twitch.tv forward slash mosh talks. Find the link in the description below. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and I'll see you on notfest.com for all of the latest news, features and much more from the worlds of rock, metal and beyond. And...